Thank you, Lynn. I appreciate it. I want to welcome everybody today to the first of our faculty lectures that accompany the 2022 Spectrum exhibition. This year's participants are Lynn Casabon, who will be uh, uh, producing a lecture today, as well as Lisa Morin and Kathy Marmer. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Lynn Casabon for today's lecture, and I hope that everybody will respond with questions at the end because uh, the work is, is really interesting and innovative. I do want to say that for viewers who want to utilize uh, closed captioning, it is available on the website here uh, with WebEx and they need to access their multimedia viewer in order to uh, get that happening for them in terms of closed captioning. Um, I just want to read a little bit about Lynn. She's had a, a very, very productive career. Uh, Lynn Kazwan creates multi-part research-based interdisciplinary projects centered on the intersection of environmental and social issues. She utilizes a wide variety of media and methods in her project projects, including community collaborations, public displays, photography, virtual, virtual reality, web and mobile device, platforms, audio, and video. Um, she's exhibited nationally and internationally. Um, just a short list of where she's shown her work. Uh, was the Museum of Contemporary Art in Bucharest, Romania, Science Gallery Lab Detroit, WRO Art Center in Rockau, Klau, Poland, and the uh, Govet Brewster Art Gallery in New Plymouth, New Zealand. Zero one, we're going to do four more. Zero one, Biennial San Jose, California, Vox Gallery, Montreal Candidate, and the Mattress Factory in Pittsburgh, PA. That by no means uh, it gives a wide enough scope to where she's exhibited. So with, without further ado, um, I'm really interested in, in hearing more about what Lynn is presenting as part of Spectrum this year in terms of lighting the exhibition and uh, looking at her work in particular. So thank you very much. Let's get to Lynn Casabon. Thank you, Sims. I appreciate your intro, which covered uh, exhibitions over a long period of time. So it's interesting to, to hear the ones you chose. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen, of course, and make sure that I select share audio. I hope that anybody who can't hear something or see something, please let me know somehow. I'm going to put to slideshow mode. Okay. So thank you for coming. Um, I'm going to focus on two projects mainly that are in the exhibition at the CADVC, um, Diluvian and Losing Winter. Um, but I'm also going to mention um, a few other projects that um, occurred over the same time period that connect conceptually and also will give a wider view of my uh, practice. So this image is actually not in the show. It's a Diluvian from 2013. It's a 40 um, eight by 10 print um, mosaic. Um, and the series actually started back in 2008, I, I would say. Um, I actually have been proceeding with this series over sporadic summers, especially when I have residencies um, because the process requires very long solar exposures and outside space that uh, I can spread out. Um, the series, and I, you know, showing it in the in the exhibition, I, I wanted to show kind of two two projects that kind of point backwards and one that points, you know, forward where I feel like I'm going with my work. So this is the one that sort of points backwards. Um, so the title of the of the series, Diluvian, um, refers to flood, the word flood. It's kind of an ancient word. It actually refers to the biblical flood. And uh, I chose it because it refers to the electronic devices that are scattered throughout the images in this series that have, uh, many of which have flowed through my life um, over the past uh, 20 years or so. Um, so it's, it's, it's about obsolescence. And that's a theme that I'll show in a couple other projects that um, has threaded through my work for many years. So these are um, unique uh, cameraless contact prints. Um, uh, and sometimes they're called lumen prints. Uh, people know them as lumen prints. Um, they don't um, 
they, they're, they're like photograms. Uh, they're created uh, by laying objects directly on the paper. Um, and in this case, um, uh, laying organic materials and uh, obsolete electronic parts on the paper and uh, exposing it for, for many hours in the sun. And the juxtaposition is really just simply thinking about the rate of decay of these materials, which are even electronic materials being manufactured come from nature, the different elements, um, but they are, you know, they don't decay in the same way as a, an organic material does. And I, I think that's a problem. Um, the, uh, the paper that I'm using in this series is actually also obsolete. It's photographic paper that's been expired uh, that's expired past its uh, its use, and I've for you know many years. And my my teaching practice you know spans uh, analog photography and digital photography, and I've collected many boxes of expired photo paper and decided to put it to use. And so there's actually kind of a a closed loop with this project where the materials I'm using to make the prints also points towards that theme of obsolescence as as well as these uh, um, electronic objects. Um, with with expired photo paper, if you don't know, uh, it's typically when it passed its its uh, due date, it's fogged, so it's either pre-exposed with light, so it doesn't um, uh, have the same tonal range as a as a fresh box of photo paper, or it's chemically fogged, and it, it has kind of unpredictable results. Um, and in this process, like I said, I'm exposing it for, for many hours, and no developer is used. If I did develop these, they immediately turn black. It would convert all the the silver halide crystals to uh, black uh, metallic silver. Instead, um, they're just um, just because of long exposure and the combination of the heat uh, and also the heavy sheets of glass that I have on top of the objects uh, creates a kind of chemical reaction. And colors actually emerge in the paper, for this black and white paper kind of, and the first time I saw it, I was just like, that's really cool. <laughs> I wanna do more of this, but actually, um, the, the colors are fugitive um, and they're kind of pumped up with uh, so dilute solutions of baking soda and vinegar that I use as well in the, in the process, but they do um, fade uh, or um, go to black eventually. So um, this process is actually a very experimental process where I uh, tried um, different ways of fixing the prints to kind of capture that color or retain that color uh, using um, different dilutions of sodium thiosulfate. Also, these prints are one of a kind. That's another thing that's interesting about them. Um, I just wanted to point to a couple of previous or older works that connect with this uh, process, uh, handmade process of making these prints. Um, this, this is actually a, a, a detail of a, a large print from a plaid series, which I did in the late 1990s, way long ago, um, that were created with an elaborate handmade process using uh, hand process Super 8 movie film, and uh, dyes or, or colored dyes and weaving them together to create uh, uh, color prints. Um, so that the, the Diluvian series kind of also uses that kind of handmade process and I feel goes back to the beginnings of photography. Also another series called Discard that ranged from about 2001 to 2009, where I was um, making images from obsolete movie films, literally films that were discarded by public institutions. In this case, this film was discarded by the Pratt Library in Baltimore. Um, this, this particular print is from 2004. And then also um, this project called Junk Space, which actually was a, um, an animation um, that aligned earthbound electronic objects with the path of orbital debris above the earth. So this was a collaboration with a former colleague, Neil McDonald, um, to make that uh, happen. And so it was it pre presented it as installations, as projections, as well as an app we created, which is no longer functioning because it wasn't updated. That's the, the life of uh, creating an app. Um, and um, this uh, project, actually, as, as the objects go into the center of the screen, you see them kind of pop up in size and the name of the piece of corresponding uh, debris uh, appears at the bottom. Um, oops, let me just advance the slide here. There we go. Um, so this, the, the, the images that are in the exhibition at the CUDBC uh, were a particular group that I made using a roll, a very unique 
uh, material, a roll of uh, photographic vellum that I inherited. And this particular roll has, an, I think, a long history in the Department of Visual Arts. I think Chris Paraguay, it came from Chris Paraguay, but uh, actually the originator was, I believe, David Yeager, who some people here know, um, uh, who had this, this you know, role produced by Kodak, this very unique role. So it is, uh, you know, has that translucent quality of vellum, but it, uh, it, it is also light sensitive uh, black and white material. So um, the, the, they have a, a, you know, light passes through the back of them, but also I feel like the, this particular group really, um, I thought of as looking down at the ground, you know, as opposed to the junk space when you're looking up at, at the objects in the way that it was installed, you're looking up. In this case, you're looking down at, at the ground or at, um, a very shallow kind of pool of water or a landfill um, at these objects um, and organic materials. Um, the size of these um, are approximately 20 by 24, 20 by 25. You can see that they have irregular edges uh, from hand, you know, hand trimming the paper from the roll. Um, and it really is like a kind of mass of merging mass of uh, manufactured and natural um, materials. Um, they all also the process, you know, I mentioned it's handmade process. It's also very much, you know, I enjoy making these. Uh, the process is like it's more like painting, um, you know, experimental and, and um, in, in that sense of uh, immediate kind of results. So um, it's a, it's a nice contrast to some of my other uh, work using newer technologies. Um, as I'm, I'm going towards talking about losing winter, I'm going to talk about two other projects uh, briefly to sort of talk about the the lineage of my practice. So um, I mentioned themes of obsolescence, which were in kind of work in the um, 2000s and uh, uh, many projects in the, in the 2000s uh, and uncultivated is a project I started in way back in 2010 and it's still it's still ongoing um, about um, wild plants and urban landscapes um, and the project is is wide ranging with a lot of different parts to it um, but it also carries that theme of obsolescence in and actually I've kind of made a conscious decision to turn towards the the natural world and think about obsolescent aspects of nature and I set, settled upon weeds. So of course weeds are, are not a species of plant but they're just plants that we think of as as unwanted uh, or as an aspect of the natural world that we think of as trash. And a lot of times um, you know people who in, in cities will see certain species of plants and locations will you know interpret that space as um, unkempt or um, dangerous even. Um, so these, you know, these plants uh, kind of carry uh, a lot of baggage with them, cultural baggage. Um, this uh, particular project is, um, you know, carries carries with it a kind of a series of things that I continue in my practice. That it's a site specific project, so it's it's very site specific in that um, over the years, I depending on where I'm showing, I go to the places and photograph plants in the local you know, local region. I uh, work with others to identify the species, and there's actually a website for the project that um, all the photographs in the project are on that website with the species as, as best as I can identified and information about those species, their um, ecological function, and their definitely their history of use by humans. Um, this particular image is from 2018 from um, a fellowship I had with the, the Point CDC in the Bronx. And, and the Southern Bronx, and um, did a series of, um, of bus shelter posters. And in this case, um, the common names of that plant, um, I'm blanking out, <laughs> Stelia medaria is the name of the, the Latin name of the plant, uh, chickweed. Um, the common names in Spanish are uh, over the, the image, over the image. And that's because that's the most dominant language uh, spoken in that part of the Bronx. Um, just to think about the cult, I, I'm really interested in these common names because they tell you a lot about how we regard a plant. Um, the other thing that in cultivated that kind of carries through in losing winter is uh, the incorporation of uh, workshops. Um, 
So different activities, events that um, I started uh, weaving into my practice that I, I believe or I feel like are part of the, the projects I listed as a as an element in the, in the media that I'm using, not only their photographs and, and the website, but also uh, public workshops, public events. Um, uh, the project it has evolved as well over time, and that continues to be a strategy that I use in my work. And there's a participatory element as well in, in Cultivated in the fact that the public is involved. And then I'll talk about participatory strategies more fully. Um, we're present in my project called uh, Portrait Garden from 2014. Um, and I, I would say this project most more radically um, highlighted what I think of today or currently anyway, as essentially um, a kind of part of of what art is, which is an extended and sometimes elaborate form of social exchange. So kind of, you know, I my background is in photography, but really I'm kind of going more towards this kind of essential thing, which I believe that the purpose of art is, you know, it's a form of social exchange. Um, and in that regard, like uh, portrait art, it, it requires or entails participation of, of the public and it actually more accurate to say the participation of a particular public or particular communities of people. In this case, I was working with a group of women who were at the time incarcerated at the Maryland Correctional Institute for Women in Jessup, Maryland. And um, I worked with these women to kind of create a program of environmental stewardship where we actually made gardens on the prison grounds over um, a three month period. We also they also selected plants to represent themselves and those became the subject of the photographs I created that you're seeing here on the left these posters with the um, the plant as it came up the following spring after we planted them and a quote from the 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 participating woman and these were actually recorded interviews audio interviews and you can access them through the QR code so they this project was also um, you know it was participatory it had a public uh, display as well in um, light rail trains in Baltimore as a way to kind of bring the project back into the public um, uh, spotlight. And you could, um, you know, hear the audio on the go on your um, mobile phone. Also, this project lose, uh, connects to losing winter through the seasons. So the seasons were actually very present in this project, in, in my mind anyway, because um, I chose perennials, perennial plants. Uh, you know, you plant them and they reemerge the following spring and that's the cycle I follow is to plant in the fall and the following spring and in the winter uh, they're dormant um, there's a period of dormancy and I was very consciously thinking of that as part of the program with these women um, talking to them over several months that they would um, you know a process of self-reflection and in, in in the winter where they couldn't go outside um, pondering that and then and having those plants come back the following spring um, so Know, the seasons were implicated. Um, then, you know, losing winter, it's very much, uh, you know, front and center, the seasons or the season of winter. The kernel of, of losing winter actually came from a feeling of sadness I, that was sparked by this photograph of myself. <laughs> At about age 15, I rediscovered this photograph. It was uh, taken of me by my father in Michigan, where I grew up at the edge of um, Lake St. Clair, frozen Lake St. Clair. That day, uh, it sparked this memory in me very vividly of that feeling of cold, of frozen fingers and frozen toes, because I was not dressed appropriately for the day. I had I got a new sweater and I didn't want to wear a coat, and my father indulged me. Uh, and, but actually, I was very unhappy that, when that photograph was taken, very, very cold, watching my brother and sister skate. But this photograph also made me feel sad because I realized that the lake, that lake where my um, mother and siblings still live no longer freezes in the winter so you can't go skating on it and it, you know I used to go skating on it every winter as a child and that it also it made me sad because my nephews who live in that same area uh, don't experience winter um, the way I did it's not the same as it was when I was a child so it made me realize how much um, climate change has impacted has intersected I guess with the seasons uh, within my lifetime um, and actually, there's a there's a theory, biology shifting baselines theory, that describes the way 
um, describes a change to the way a system is measured against previous reference points over a long period of time. Um, so this theory actually originated in um, looking at overfishing, but um, with, you know, you can apply it to other systems and with regard to climate change, um, the shifting baselines is a tendency for each generation to have a different expectation of what's normal for a season or a slime. So, you know, as as things proceed with climate change, where our, our expectations of what how winter should be or how summer should be are are shifting very slowly, um, maybe imperceptibly. Um, but I think also it becomes a kind of uh, will a way to forget uh, each each year. Um, you know, with each generation, uh, and we can just say, well, things are okay. This is the way it's always been. It's never been different. Um, but with that, um, I think comes a loss, a loss of the way things we we knew, but also cultural traditions are intertwined with the seasons, family traditions, customs, um, and those are also going to change or are changing. Um, and actually, I, I also realized that the feeling of sadness I've had more recently, I've real I've learned that it has a name ecological grief. Um, it's actually a mental health uh, response to ecological loss that's been documented and is being studied. And I'm definitely um, experiencing that uh, that grief. So in, in the project Losing Winter, um, uh, I'm using the season of winter as a lens on, you know, through which to focus on climate change without directly just talking to people about climate change, which is a real turnoff uh, for most people. Um, but, you know, to talk about the season, it, how climate change is intersecting with our lives on a local scale. Um, I also want to just mention um, or talk a little bit about the difference between weather and climate, because, of course, they're not the same thing, but they intersect. The way that I'd like to explain it is using an analogy of um, mood versus personality. So weather is like mood. Of course, it changes day to day, hour to hour. It's uh, transitory. Climate is more like personality. It's the pattern of weather over a long period of time in a particular place. And uh, what we are experiencing is um, a change in weather patterns. Um, this project actually, um, you know, also it, it, it actually started further back from when I actually started, you know, creating it. it. The first, I first started developing the idea back in 2014 during a residency I did in the Yukon in Northern Canada. I created a series of audio and photographic portraits of 10 women that I met there, um, speaking to them about their encounters or challenges with the weather there. And I discovered through those conversations that many, several, several of the women had actually moved there from Southern Canada. They were seeking winter, you know, real winter. They were also seeking a connection with nature that was not possible anymore um, in, you know, the Southern parts of very urbanized parts of Canada. Um, and, you know, expanding from my my small experience, I realized that, you know, the um, th this loss that I was feeling, the sadness is even more profound for people who live in those regions in the subarctic and the Arctic, because changes are happening much more profoundly. And of course, the cultural traditions connected to winter are, you know, deeply woven into people's identity there. Um, so losing winter was a way for me to approach the topic of climate change. Um, you know, and in a way that I felt had the potential to have a real life impact on people. Um, and, uh, you know, to the, the idea was to collect memories from people of winter for a future listener. In particular, I'm thinking of a young listener um, or one that, you know, isn't born. Um, and climate change is can be abstract and unapproachable to many people. It's a conversation stopper in many times, many times. So I wanted to make it um, provide an entry point uh, for conversation to to start. Um, I think also uh, this this doing this project here in the temperate part of the world, where um, actually the centers of power are, and also we might not think about we might think of climate change as something far away is also quite um, deliberate as well. It's also a funny kind of conversation starter. Of course, the weather you know you say like you don't have anything to talk about somebody, you, you talk about the weather. So it's kind of a joke uh, for someone like me, an introverted and mostly shy person to be able to go up to a stranger and talk to them. Uh, the weather is the perfect uh, topic uh, to start a conversation. 
So Losing Winter actually was the first, um, I would say realization of the project was in 2018 with a residency I did with the National um, Museum of Contemporary Art in Bucharest, Romania. This came from a commission that I, I won where I was um, commissioned to do a community-based project. Um, I proposed to do it in the summer. So I was in Bucharest for three months in the summer of 2018. Um, and I deliberately did that because I wanted to talk to people about winter in a season that was far away from winter because, you know, in the summer when it's very hot, you might be dreaming of cooler temperatures and also you're not caught up in the kind of uh, irritating parts of a season at that point. It's farther away from you and you might reminisce about it more. These two images here, um, the graphics of icicles designed for these came from as I was there in, in Bucharest talking to people about a custom in Bucharest of people putting up these handmade signs that say on the left, um, watch out for falling art, um, icicles in Romanian. So people make these signs, uh, print print them out and put them up everywhere because the old buildings have in the winter have actually quite dangerous looking icicles hanging off of them that can hurt people. Um, so I decided to make the, this um, the part of the graphics for the exhibition and on the left, it was a postcard that we put in different places to get people to be interested to participate and on the right is the um, the poster for the exhibition. Also, um, part of this in, in Bucharest, I also partnered with a local business, La Strada Ice Cream, um, asking them to donate uh, these um, individual ice creams to give to people in exchange for them giving me a memory. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't mention this before, but I, in Portrait Garden, it's this, it also, I don't pay people for participating in my projects and I'm actually against that as a principle um, because I want it to be an exchange that's not, um, doesn't have the baggage of uh, capitalism, I guess, but, but I do in this case give, gave the ice cream as an exchange or I also think the act of listening of careful listening is part of the exchange as well as well as well as other things I can talk about. Um, so we organized events at local cafes at, at different places. Uh, this was uh, one of those uh, to record people's uh, memories. Um, and uh, I can play. I think I have one here. I'll play one of the Bucharest memories in English. Some half of them were in Romanian, but many people spoke English. What uh, I'm able to remember from my childhood is that uh, during winter, because uh, we experienced communism, in my house was uh, very cold. We had to put a lot of clothes on us to uh, have some warmth, but still, even in this context, I'm really nostalgic. Why? Because it was my childhood. <laughs> and uh, I'm sure that I cannot recover anymore this past uh, time. And for sure, I remember that Moș Gerila, which was uh, Sanda for uh, Romanian people, Moș Gerila, was surely coming with some oranges because once or twice uh, on a winter time, we had oranges. We couldn't access oranges in other times of the year. And for sure, with some toy. One toy at least. Um, also in, um, in Bucharest, I collaborated or worked with an, a local ice sculptor. So I had this idea to make a video that involved ice sculptures that would be um, inspired or created in response to illustrate um, some of the memories I was collecting from participants in Bucharest. So uh, as far as the budget goes, we were able to make 10 ice sculptures. So I created designs for them um, and the ice sculptor actually carved them. Um, he was really excited by the project because it wasn't the usual swans and things like that that you make for weddings, um, but it was something you know more interesting. So the, the sculptures became the subject of a, um, the, my video Melt, which is in the exhibition. Um, I just want to say a couple things about it. I'll just show a little clip of it, but um, the sculptures were positioned uh, in key locations inside and outside the museum. The museum is actually in a very interesting location. It's in the Palace of the Parliament in Bucharest. It's a ginormous, <laughs> a colossal neoclassical building that was uh, built by um, Nicholas Ceausescu in the 1980s. So it's it's the style of it looks like it was made in the 19th century, but it was actually made in the 1980s. But it's just this monument to his ego. 
Um, it's also uh, across the road from a newly constructed People's Salvation Cathedral, which is the R Romanian Orthodox Church, which has very um, complicated uh, resonance with r people in Bucharest. In fact, there were protests going on when I was there in 2018 against the ties between the state and the church. Um, and the, in, in those protests, there was a flag with a hole in it, which you'll actually see as one of the ice sculptures uh, in, in the video, um, which actually originated for, when, in the fall of communism in 1989, uh, which actually happened in January 1999. So it was actually part of many people's memories as well about winter, where people cut the, so, the Soviet insignia out of the center of the Romanian flag. And so that symbol of the flag with the hole in it continues to be very uh, kind of um, relevant to, to Romanian people. And they use it in contemporary, um, in contemporary protests. So I'm going to play just a, a little section from the middle here. Let me get maybe around. Here's the flag. Sorry, got on my slideshow here. Um, the whole video is about. Sorry, <laughs> um, you can see it in the in the exhibition. Um, so after uh, that project coming back to Baltimore, um, in twenty nineteen, I started to develop an idea for doing an augmented reality version of the project. So, um, augmented reality, as most of you probably know, is, um. Uh, medium that uses uh, that superimposes digital elements onto real life. So you often is done through a through a mobile phone um, that has a camera built in. Um, my first idea actually was not very practical. I wanted to continue with this idea of the ice sculptures, kind of uh, capturing an image from the memory. You know, to actually create images for each memory, but that was, really wasn't practical to do. Also, um, initially, I was interested in using kind of installation kind of versions of augmented reality, but then I realized I really want this project because I want it to be ac accessible to a wide audience and be able to be global in scale. So the mobile device actually made more sense to actually work with mobile phones. Um, so um, also it changed at that point of you know trying to picture the memory to putting the person through video inside uh, what is a kind of representational ice drop um, inside the app. So in 2020, I received a grant from the Saul Zantz Innovation Fund here in Baltimore, which actually gave me half of what I asked for, unfortunately, but it was great. It was a wonderful grant. And it did allow me to work with the Imaging Research Center at, at UMBC with Lee Boot and the, UMB, you know, the IRC staff. So I used those funds, every penny of them to create what is the prototype of the app, which is now functioning. It, it does operate on iOS platforms um, and it's free. So you can, you can download it if you have an iPhone. It was working on Android, but then it stopped working because of the uh, vagaries of uh, mobile device development. But we're working on with an, I, I'm working with an um, ISMA student right now who I hope will be able to get it back up on Android again. Um, so right now it is a display portal. So you, when you open it, it's a very, um, it's a very uh, minimal uh, interface. I'm going to show you the next slide, where you you hold up the the mobile phone and you just see um, a shower of raindrops and you'll see some ice drops or some little pellets in falling down at a slower rate. You tap on the screen and it will enlarge one of those drops 
sort of freeze it to the middle of the screen and start playing the video that's encased in there. So there's a person sort of frozen as a still image first, and then it turns to video. As the person progresses, they tell their story. At the end of their story, they disappear and the drop uh, turns into water. So this is showing just the sequence of images as it, it melts and then turns back to a drop of water, which is a very, you know, very iconic image of a tear, a teardrop, and it's very deliberately uh, referencing that actually, you know, physically the way water melts, it doesn't actually look like that, but I really wanted to kind of make that superimposition of the, the rain and uh, tears. Um, so initially, um, I actually, I don't know if Lee Boot is here, but initially I wanted to have the app, you know, so that you can record and upload you themselves, but actually that became, apparent we would not be able to accomplish that with the amount of uh, grant money that I had, but I've actually kind of been reconsidering that because what I am continuing to do with this project is to realize it in different manifestations at different locations. And each time, each look, you know, each realization in, involves a process of collecting memories. And that's actually where I'm interacting with people one-on-one. -on -one. I mean, actually many throughout this year, it's been a lot of virtual or Zoom recordings, but most of the time, you know, my preference is for uh, in-person encounters with people. Um, and also there's a, a, each realization or exhibition has unique engagement and programming uh, components to it. So I actually kind of am not against the idea of loading these memories as I collect them kind of manually into the back end of the app. Uh, it also allows me to have, you know, more editing control. Um, so actually what you're seeing here, this image here is, is in our current exhibition that's <laughs> Lee Boot just said, makes sense, love it. Um, this image is from um, a current exhibition at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. Um, so maybe some of you know, uh, Maryland Center for History and Culture it used to be called the Maryland Historical Society. Um, and I approached them actually before the pandemic in 2019. Uh, when I was just starting to have the ideas about the, um, the mobile app. Um, and I, with an exhibition proposal to, to record memories from Maryland residents and to show those in the context of a historical exhibition that would pair uh, the recordings with um, photographs from the Maryland Center for History and Culture's uh, collections. There was a pause, of course, due to the pandemic, like most things, but in late 2020, they gave, gave me the go ahead to go with, go with the exhibition. And so we organized um, workshops or, or recording sessions virtually through, through Zoom. Um, the exhibition opened in, in July of 2021, um, and the actual uh, historical exhibition I co-curated with Joe Trapia at MCHC, and it consists of photographs from MCHC, but also special collections at UMBC. So we also have a number of photographs um, from special collections. Um, the, let me show you some views of the exhibition. Um, so uh, the, that image in the middle is actually a, a portion of an Aubrey Bodine photograph that we've had made into a kind of light box over the window in the in the gallery. And also the uh, app is just this is how it's featured in the exhibition. It's on a large vertical monitor and it's screen recordings like it is actually in the CADBC exhibition. I recorded did screen recordings in the um, the gallery. So it's as if you're standing in that same space and you're seeing the um, the um, the recordings of, of the uh, the memories. And this is another view. Um, we also have a couple of um, uh, videos in the exhibition too. The, at the back is a, it's actually a film from 1928 called The Picturesque Susquehanna. And uh, on the right is a, um, it's a compilation of WJZ, which is Baltimore Station, their weather forecasts from the 1970s and 80s. And it features a cameo of uh, Oprah Winfrey, who actually worked in Baltimore. Um, so that's a kind of fun thing where she's uh, showing people ice skating on Memorial uh, Stadium rink. Um, a couple of the photographs, this is a beautiful, uh, not such great condition photograph in the MCHC's collection of the Baltimore fire in 1904, which happened in February. And what you're seeing here is this it, building was, um, it contained, I think it was like fertilizer or something, and so it was explosive. And so because of the fire, uh, they were concerned about it, you know, blowing up. They, the fire department sprayed it with water, which immediately froze because of the cold temperatures. And as the uh, police uh, posing in front of it. 
and also another photograph in the show, uh, this is Aubrey Bodin by Aubrey Bodin, who's a well-known Baltimore, or, you know, Maryland photographer, uh, a very uh, staged uh, Groundhog Day photograph. We, this is one of my favorites, even though I was against including it at first because it's actually in Pennsylvania, of course, but it's uh, marks that um, weird uh, custom of, you know, humans trying to predict the start and end of, you know, start of spring, the end of winter that we continue to do this sort of theater. And actually I, I read about it actually originated from Christian traditions in Germany and kind of got changed over here in the US and Pennsylvania where a lot of Germans uh, settled. Um, also, I, I did, I received a, um, a Maryland State Arts Council creativity grant to pay to, um, to, to create two large multi-block ice sculptures that for the opening event in July, on July 24th at, um, at the Maryland Center for History and Culture. One of the sculptures was this one in um, representing the memory of Susan Law, who's standing there behind them. Um, <clears throat> the memory was from 1958 Anne Arundel County, a memory of her and her, her mother uh, pulling her and her brothers and sisters um, on sleds in the snow during a, a big uh, blizzard. The other was a live ice sculpture carving. This is the Chesapeake Bay Bridge. And it was from a memory that actually a number of people shared with me in different forms of the 1976-77 deep freeze when the Chesapeake Bay actually froze so much so that people could drive cars over it. So it was a, a very you know big Arctic blast that many, many people uh, remembered and had experiences with. Um, also with MCHC, I've organized programming. And so this is a, you know, just a stupid Zoom uh, a screenshot, but this is one of the um, panels. This is from November, 2021, a panel discussion that focused on changing weather patterns in Maryland. It included Dan Berry, who's from NOAA. He's a program director of modeling analysis and uh, predictions. And Erin Posthumus from the, um, from the USA National Phenology Network. So she looks at um, the season, seasonal triggers for plants and animals and how climate change will affect, uh, affect those. Um, and then on March 16th, we're having a pan, uh, uh, an in-person event, a screening of, a, of High Tide in Dorchester, which is a film by David Harp. Um, he actually has, one of his photographs is in the exhibition. It's, it's part of the UMBC collection. Um, and we're gonna have a panel discussion with him and Alex Green is the director of the Harriet Tubman tours in Dorchester County about climate change impacts on historical sites, as well as Mike Tidwell, the director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network. Um, the exhibition at MCHC is actually been extended through July, 2023, and we will be um, replacing some of the photographs that have to be taken back um, because of conservation reasons. Um, I also um, was able to realize the project it, with VizArts and Rockville. Um, this is sort of overlapped with the MCHC show, a smaller exhibition. Uh, and this actually, I think, well, moving forward, I really um, want to continue with this where I'm talking to older people and pairing them with younger people. So there's a kind of cross-generational conversation. So in this case, I um, recorded memories from Montgomery County, individuals aged, I would say 60 plus, uh, and then worked with VizArts because they actually have classes. Um, work, we, we had two uh, free workshops for kids. They were aged 10, eight, eight, 10 years old, fused glass and fabric collage. So we showed them some of the memories and they created um, uh, artwork you know, with those techniques we were showing them. Um, and this is like on the left is one of the participants and on the right is one of the fused glass. And I, I like to fuse glass because it really looks like ice. So they, you know, not only did they respond to the recording, so it's also the, the idea is to get a kind of careful listening. So the young person is listening <laughs> and also making something with their hands in response to what they're hearing, but also they infuse their own memories and experiences of the season of winter in what they create. Um, so it's a kind of, you know, act of careful listening and art making. And then uh, actually currently, I also have an exhibition go at the Smith College up in Northampton, Massachusetts at the Orsman Gallery. Um, it's a small space in uh, Smith College. And I, I actually made several trips up there to, to do this project. Um, so I used it in the end as a way to, my, what I proposed was to work with Smith College students and um, 
older people in, I thought Northampton, but it ends up being Sp uh, Springfield, Massachusetts, which is about a half an hour south of Northampton, um, working with senior centers in, in Springfield to record memories and then working with a theater class at Smith College. So a theater professor I connected with, um, what the idea was the, I recorded the memories and then we shared those recordings with this, the class and each person chose an individual to create a monologue from. So again, a kind of careful listening and then they created these monologues which they performed. And then I went back to Northampton to, to record the performances and that's part of the display. Um, it's actually, there's actually another interesting aspect of it because Springfield is kind of a economically, you know, much, uh poorer more diverse economically as well as racially than northampton which is more wealthy so i i, I also like the fact that there was this kind of um you know cross-cultural and cross-generational um you know interchange um i know we're probably i was going to play you two two other video clips I'm going to play just a portion of this one, which kind of pairs, um, you know, the original memory and then the student's response. I'll just play a little bit of these. Maybe 19, oh, maybe 1940, 48. We used to have great winters. We had hills that we could take our sleds down and, and go. We don't get the winters like that anymore. They're, they're a lot more milder, you know. But they have a lot of memories, and the ponds used to freeze over where you could go skating, at skate, you know, at Van Horn and whatnot. We just don't have it. We just don't get the weather like we used to. I can remember when I was a child, the snow used to be high. We don't get that much snow anymore. Uh, we had sleds, you know, and if we didn't have a sled, you had a piece of cardboard. That's a, for, times were hard then, you know. Gloria, you made me think of changes, and I don't normally like change, but I liked listening to you talk, and I liked remembering as you spoke, and after you spoke. We don't get winters like that anymore, you said. I believe you. Less snow, more slush, less sledding, more sloshing through cold, dark days. Winter changed for me, too. I don't stuff snow down the back of Jack my neighbor's coat anymore, or suit up and snop, sopping snow pants more than once, if once on a snow day, or use his snow-covered trampoline as a ring for Russell, our favorite non-sledding game. When we played outside all day, sledding or tackling or tunneling through white banks, well, Jack always had a gap that disturbed me very much between his mittens and the ends of his coat sleeves. Snow would get packed in, the, in that gap there on his bare and skinny wrists. But it didn't bother him. You were right. Being frozen was not much of a concern. Sorry. Maybe 19. Gloria. No, maybe ah, there was a weird um, frame rate thing going on here with uh, sharing the screen. Um, so at CADVC, uh, you see that I have a, a monitor that has screen recordings that I actually did in the gallery, which was challenging because the installation went up to the. So some some actually shots have Sims doing the lighting in the background or um, different, you know, different parts of the installation process, which is fine. Um, so I'll play um, this short one of this is actually Susan Law, one of one of the memories she shared with me. Oh, I was in the third grade, so that would have been maybe 56. I actually broke my arm sledding in the woods down a, a wood, a fairly, not a very wide path, but it was one of the only hills around. And I was heading for a big tree, so I wrapped my arm around a little tree, not thinking I would break my, my arm. I was breaking my sled. <laughs> Um, and broke my arm. So that's my excuse for not ever writing. Uh, my my cursive writing is just horrible. I mean, nobody could ever read it. And that was my excuse is because that's when I was learning cursive writing. <laughs> so I have an excuse.
I'm going to stop there and I just muted myself and yeah. Can you hear me? <laughs> so I don't know if anybody else is still here. Thank you for sending me a little emoji of clapping hands, whoever you are. <laughs> yeah, um, let's, uh, let's give people a chance to ask questions now if they want. Well, my first question is, is losing winter still available to visit? Oh, you're, lo you're muted, Lynn. Sorry. I got that from Kathy. I don't know. Maybe it's my earphone. There we go. You're back. Can you on. hear me? You you can yeah. hear me now. Okay. Yes. Um. Yes. Uh, Losing winter is still is still on view at the Maryland Center for History and Culture up through next year. Um. Actually, and I'll be continuing to realize the project in different locations. Right. Kathy O'Dell is, is let me know she has a question. How does this work in a webinar? <laughs> like, does she have to write it or does she? Because it looks I like I can't unmatch her. Uh oh, unmute her. Okay, there's some things in the chat. Maybe I'll I'll look at that. Yeah, you could. I'm getting them from Lee and Kathy and Steve Bradley. Kathy says she doesn't have sound, but I know Lee's put one up and so Steve Bradley. Yeah, so Kathy, if you can type so it looks because. Yeah. We have to do it this way. Okay. It says, Lee Boot, are you considering more of back more in back and forth videos where one person responds? Um, yes, but actually it's not that perfect. The ones I showed you worked aligned very well, but the responses are not so direct sometimes or so so obvious, where she was actually addressing Gloria in her um, mm -hmm. in her video. But uh yes, I think that this kind of you know, to get to kind of literally have the conversation, the cross general com conversation. And actually, I'm also thinking of different ways to, you know, display the videos uh, in, you know, different configurations. <coughs> um, Steve Bradley. And Steve had a question too, Steve Bradley. Can you discuss your process of interviewing various co contributors for your projects, logistics? <clears throat> perhaps discovery through experience. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, of course I do interview them, but I don't actually think of these so much as interviews, honestly. It's it's more like a conversation where I just say, start talking, <laughs> you know, give me, give me a memory about winter. And then I might ask questions to elicit more detail, but um, I don't think of them as interviews so much as, um, you know, they're, they're giving me a story uh, with, uh, with, with guidance, but definitely it makes a huge difference if they're just, you know, I think if they're talking to a human or talking to their phone, you know, you have diff a different response. Although I did, I did get some of the memories, um, for the Maryland Center for History and Culture did come from people just sending me videos they had recorded. I never met them. So some people are, you know, are, are fine with that format too. And then Kathy's question was, what are the youngest kids you've worked with? Well, the Viz Arts were probably so far the, the, the youngest. So they were like eight years old, so a couple of the oh, kids wow. in the workshop. Um, they didn't meet the older people directly. You know, they saw the videos. Of course, with COVID, that <laughs> there was a practical reason behind that. But I think also it's kind of interesting for them to see, you know, to have this conversation through mediated through video. Um, I'm, I'm personally fine with that. This, this conversation I'm talking about is not you know, can be literal through different events, but it doesn't necessarily have to be always literal in the, in the uh, artwork itself. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm continuing, this project is evolving and I, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what, what comes 
in the next iterations um, with the ages of kids. Very cool. Okay. I answered the questions. Anybody else have a question? Thank you for coming, everybody. Well, thank you, Lynn. It was really a really great lecture. And um, I, for me, uh, it, it definitely makes me think it'd be a real task to put all your work together in a retrospective because it has so many different platforms. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's a, and I mean that as a compliment. It's really interesting. Yeah, actually, you know what, I, you know what, the working, you know, showing in this show with a spectrum, I kind of, it's more like a retrospective or something, kind of showing work from the past, you know. Sure. Where, whereas normally I might realize a site-specific version of a project. This is kind of showing. Uh, versions well, I'm of really looking sensor. forward to seeing losing winter. It looks awesome from your the documentation. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.